All righty. Chapter 10, Respirations and Artificial Ventilation. Um, we're going to start off with physiology and pathophysiology. Um, remember, ventilation is a process of moving air in and out of the chest. That's what the definition of ventilation. Inhalation is an active process. We have to contract muscles for us to work, so the diaphragm will contract and the chest muscle will expand. This will increase the size of the chest, which creates a negative pressure and it pulls air into the lung. So we have an atmospheric pressure, let's just say of 780 um, millimeters of mercury, and we make our chest wall bigger and our chest cavity bigger, that drops that pressure inside the lungs, forcing air in. When we exhale, it's a passive process. That means it doesn't take any effort, right? All the muscles relax. The chest size will decrease. And then this changes the pressure from a negative to a positive. So through like diffusion, air is going to leave the lungs. Uh, we talked about tidal volume in the last chapter. Tidal volume is the amount of air we move in one breath. So the average adult human is between 500 ml and 750 ml of tidal volume. Minute volume, that's where we take the tidal volume, which is the amount of air we breathe in in one breath, and we multiply it by the uh, respiratory rate uh, in the lungs per, in over a minute. This will give us our minute volume. Ventilation designed to move air in and out from the alveoli for gas exchange. It's where this happens, right? Where at the, at these little alveoli uh, that's wrapped in capillaries, and this is how that gas exchange works. But we have to remember that not all the air we breathe in reaches the alveoli. Um, we have to fill our, our trachea, our bronchi, all this path of airway, and that takes up air, which is about 150 ml. This is called your dead space. Any space that's got air that's not being used in the gas exchange is a dead space. A vehicular ventilation refers to the amount of air that actually reaches the VI. It can be altered if we change our rate or volume. That's, that makes sense, right? So if I slow my breathing down, I'm not getting as much air to my VI. Or if I'm not breathing the same amount of tidal volume. Uh, this depends heavily on tidal volume, volume and can be affected by very fast and very slow rates. A VOI are at the ends of the bronch bronchioli, which are the small bronchi tubes. Their branches of sacs are inflated and ventilated as air moves in and out. And each alveolus is a bubble-like structure. So that's one alveoli, or alveolus is, a, is a, a group of alveoli, I'm sorry. And they're like a bubble-like structure with elasticity so they can expand. The capillaries, pulmonary capillaries, bring the blood close to these sacs. And they have thin walls, both the alveoli and the capillaries. And through diffusion... We, we diffuse from a higher level to a lower level. So there's higher level of oxygen in the VLI. So it's going to move from the VLI to the bloodstream, to the capillaries. And then there's a higher concentration of CO2 or carbon dioxide in the blood. So it's going to move from the bloodstream to the VLI. Diffusion. We've talked about that several times. That's moving from a higher concentration to a lower Pulmonary respiration is diffusion of oxygen carbon dioxide between the VI and the capillaries, the bloodstream. So what we just talked about, when this higher level of oxygen goes to the uh, from the VI to the bloodstream and the CO or carbon dioxide goes from the bloodstream to the VI so they can be breathed out, this is pulmonary respiration. Now it's just opposite at the cellular level. We take the higher level of oxygen from the blood and it diffuses across the membrane into the cell and then it offloads the uh, carbon dioxide back into the blood and then circulates it back to the heart and the lungs to, for this process to go uh, over and over. 
So that is called cellular respiration when it's diffusing at the cellular level. Uh, oh, what the heck was that? All right. In order for both of these respirations, the pulmonary and the cellular, to work properly, uh, the respiratory and the circular system has to work in conjunction. They have to work together, right? Uh, when we talk about the circulatory system and the respiratory system, sometimes we combine it and call it the cardiopulmonary system. Um, we also call it the vent uh, ventilation perfusion match or the VQ. So the amount of air moving in and the amount of perfusion that's happening at the cellular level. That's your VQ ratio or match. Um, if something happened to either the respiratory or the circulatory system to where they would fail, then the process of respiration is defeated, which means we're not getting perfused at the cellular level if either one of these would fail. Mechanical failures in the cardiopulmonary system may limit the ability for the chest to create pressure, right? So a good example is a stab wound. If we get stabbed in, in, in the chest, now we have a cavity to the outside atmospheric air. So when my diaphragm expands and my or contracts and my chest wall expands, it creates a negative space, but it's going to flow through the hole where that stab wound was instead of coming through your mouth. Uh, sometimes we can lose uh, nerve control. So um, the muscles that are used during respiration doesn't work properly. That can affect it. Um, if someone gets an injury to the chest wall, they're not going to be breathing as much because it hurts when they breathe. A good example is broken ribs. If you have broken ribs, which I have had, you, you don't breathe very well because it hurts when you expand your chest wall. Um, bronchoconstriction limits your airflow. So for some reason, if your bronchi would start constricting or get occluded for some reason, either, you know, trauma, infection, whatever, this will restrict the airflow. Um, and anytime we have an interruption in this gas exchange, you're not going to be able to diffuse because you're not going to have those higher levels of oxygen, right, for to diffuse. Uh, low low oxygen levels outside air will limit. In the outside air will limit. We're held. So good examples of that is higher altitudes, um, confined spaces that may not have the the uh, oxygen levels we need. Um, underwater uh, diffusion diffusion problems caused by a VLI that don't work properly and limit the exchange, right? For some reason, your VLI is not working properly. Like they're full of fluid from CHF or their um, emphysema um, removes that elasticity so they can't expand. So all that can uh, limit the ability of this gas exchange. Or you could have a permeability issue we talked about earlier where the VLI become less permeable so it's harder for the gas exchange to happen if they can't perforate through the cell membrane or the, the walls. Uh, circuitry issues can prevent um, issues as well because if we don't have enough blood to carry the oxygen, it can't get to the cells. Um, what could be circuitry issues? We can have blood loss, so we don't have the volume, right? We don't have the volume to, to move around. Or there could be issues where we don't have enough hemoglobin. For example, people with anemia have low blood iron, which it takes iron to make the hemoglobin. So if we don't have the hemoglobin, we can't carry oxygen around. Or we could have the amount, right amount of hemoglobins, but we could be, um, there are certain issues like, for example, carbon monoxide will bind to hemoglobins. They have, a, um, I think it's like 200 times the affinity, which means It'll, it'll bind 200 times quicker than what oxygen will. Let's talk about respiration. Adequate versus inadequate breathing, right? So the brain and the body cells needs oxygen. The brain especially, it needs a lot of oxygen. The term hypoxia means low blood oxygen or levels of oxygen. So for hypoxic, that means we're not getting perfused at the cell because we have low oxygen levels. Hypercapnia is high level to carbon dioxide. So if we don't have 
if we get hypoxic and we don't have enough oxygen, then we switch into that anaerobic metabolism and then we start building up on our CO2 or carbon dioxide and we'll get hypercapnia or hypercapnia. Um, you can assess the pulmonary coronary, assess the cardiopulmonary system by evaluating how well you're oxygenating your and carbon dioxide. And how can we test how well we're oxygenating? We can do the pulse oximetry. We can do cap refill. We can look at skin tone and mentation, right? We'll talk about that a little later. When this cardiopulmonary system fails, the body will start compensating. Uh, chemoreceptors will stimulate the respiratory to, to breathe more, right? The brain senses that we have more CO2 and less oxygen, we're going to breathe more. Uh, the respiratory rate and heart rate will increase, and the blood vessels are going to constrict. They're going to try to uh, keep the pressure so the brain and the heart and the lungs get perfused and the kidneys. Respiratory distress. This is when we're having issues, but our body is compensating, right? So the higher heart rate, the higher respiratory rate we're, is compensating that our cells are still getting perfused. The patient's still going to have a normal mental status. They're going to, their skin tone or skin color is still going to be fairly normal. And their oximetry reading is going to be within normal ranges. Um, when we hit the failure state or inadequate breathing, this is when the compensation is not, no longer working. The, the body is trying to compensate, but it's not working. So we're getting hypoxic. Um, that's when the uh, metabolic needs of the body aren't met as far as oxygen goes. So then we're going to switch into the anaerobic and we're going to start building up CO2. Our vessels are going to constrict even more. Respiratory failure is, is a precursor to arrest, which means if we don't fix the respiratory failure within a certain time frame, usually not very long, we're going to go into respiratory arrest. And respiratory arrest means exactly what it says. We're uh, our respiratory system shut down. We're not breathing. Uh, inadequate breathing occurs when the challenge is too great for the body to compensate. That means, and a part of this is too, you have to realize is when we start breathing more and our heart rate goes up, we're using even more oxygen to sustain this higher heart rate and the higher respiratory rate. So that's even going to make it worse. Um, this is when the rate of breathing and depth of breathing or both can fall outside normal ranges. So we could be breathing 30 times a minute and very shallow or we could be breathing six times a minute and you know very shallow so it'd be both outside the normal uh recognition is an assessment skill and you have to do prompt action to overcome this uh, patient assessment and respiratory first we're going to determine if they're breathing or not right and if we determine they are breathing is this breathing adequate are we within normal ranges? Are we in, within normal uh, expansion? Our chest rise and fall. Is our skin tone good? Signs of inadequate or adequate, I'm sorry. Equal expansion of the chest when they inhale. We can hear air entering and leaving their nose and mouth. We can feel this air leaving their nose and mouth. Skin has a typical coloration, which is pink, warm, and dry, is what we want. The rate, rhythm, quality, and depth of breathing are typical, which means our normal rate for an adult is 12 to 20. Our rhythm is a normal rhythm. Quality, we're going to see that chest rise and fall, and that seems to be the depth. Now, let's put flip it over and let's, what is inadequate breathing signs of uh, mental status is altered right the brain's not getting enough oxygen so it's going to be altered the chest movement is either absent or minimal or uneven um, we'll talk more about that in like trauma with the uneven chest movement or it may very really be moving at all that's minimal or it's just not moving at all that's absent the pulse rate will slow in children. This is a sign of inadequate breathing. Um, sometimes they're limiting their breathing movements to the belly. They're starting to belly breathe. You can you won't hear or feel air coming in on those amount. 
Breath sounds or diminished or absence when we listen to them. Wheezing, crowing, strider, gurgling, and gasping are heard. We talked about in the last chapter, if we can hear someone breathing without actually getting down and, and doing the look, listen, and fill for an unconscious patient, that is not a good thing. On the rate of breathing, it's too rapid or too slow. Anything below 8 or above 28 is inadequate breathing. Breathing can be very shallow, very deep, or very labored. That means they, they are really working to breathe. Cyanosis. Cyanosis is in the skin, lips, tongue, ears, and elbow. Cyanosis is bluing or purplish tinting of the skin due to the lack of oxygen or them being hypoxic. Uh, inspiration or expirations are prolonged. That means it's, they're taking a long time to exhale. That's a good sign that they're building up on CO2 or carbon dioxide. The body's trying to get rid of it, breathing it out. If a patient who is normally able to speak is all of a sudden is unable to speak, or they're only able to do one one word phrases or two with you know between having to breathe. Retraction or nasal flaring, especially in children. Oxygen saturations are low, less than 90%, 95, excuse me. Body positions indicate distress. The tripod position is a good one. Uh, sitting straight up to breathe. Hypoxia, that's insignificant, insufficient supply of oxygen to the tissues. That's hypoxia. That's what it is. Low blood oxygen or low oxygen level. Common causes. People on fire. They breathe in like carbon monoxide. Um, or could have trauma to their lungs. Patient with emphysema. We talked about this earlier. They lose the elasticity of the VI. So they can't expand. Overdose on certain drugs. Can depress the respiratory uh, system. Especially narcotics like uh, heroin or heroin overdoses are not breathing because it suppresses the respiratory system, especially the muscles that control it, like the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. Patient having a heart attack, stroke, or an emboli could cause hypoxia because if a heart attack, the heart's not pumping the way they are. The stroke could affect their brain and they're not getting the neural messages. And an emboli is a blockage. Signing include, signs include cyanosis and altered mental status. Address the cause and administer oxygen. We have to figure out what's going on and fix it, right? If we can. Uh, we're going to provide artificial ventilations to non-breathing people and people that have inadequate breathing. So we're going to breathe for them. We usually do this through the BBM. Provide supplemental oxygen to people that are breathing. Uh, intervene when signs of inadequate breathing. Inadequate breathing. The patient's efforts are not meeting their demands. The condition will get worse if we don't do something about it. And it's always better to be a little more aggressive than it is not to be aggressive enough, right? So it's always better to go ahead and grab that bag and maybe try to bag a little bit as to not do anything. Positive pressure ventilations. Artificial ventilations. We're using positive pressure. We're forcing this air into the lungs. It's also called positive pressure ventilation. Uh, it's used when people aren't breathing or they don't have or they have inadequate breathing. We're going to use positive pressure. Now we use positive pressure, that's the exact exact opposite pressures that the body uses naturally to breathe, right? The body normally uses a negative pressure, so we could cause some issues, right? We can have some uh, negative side effects. Cardiac output and blood pressure will drop because the, because the heart uses negative pressure to help refill its chambers. Um, we can get some gastric distension when, when air is diverted in the stomach because of the pressure. Gastric distension can cause uh, two things. They could vomit, and that can include the airway. Or if the stomach gets too big, the diaphragm has nowhere to expand. 
Hyperventilation blows off too much carbon dioxide and leads to vasal constriction. So if they're breathing way too fast, they're blowing off CO2 or carbon dioxide. The vessels will constrict and their brain will sense that they need more oxygen so they'll breathe even more. Right? There are three methods, meth, no, excuse me, three methods that we use to deliver artificial ventilation to positive pressure. We use mouth to mouth or mouth to mask, the pocket mask. Two rescuer BVM or bag bag valve mask or on rescuer BVM. Um, and this goes without saying we're not going to ventilate someone who's vomiting, actively vomiting, or has vomits in their airway. Because if we do, we're going to shove that vomit down into the lungs, and then we're going to cause a lot of issues later. It's called aspirated pneumonia, and that's not good. So if I just had a cardiac arrest, and I, I'm breathing for them, and I shove vomit down the lungs, we happen to get this patient back, they're going to get aspirated pneumonia, and more than likely probably die anyway. Okay, what is, how are we going to ensure adequate ventilation with the positive pressure? We're going to watch the chest for rise and fall. We're going to ensure that the rate is significant or sufficient, I'm sorry, right? We're going to give them a breath for five to six seconds. Uh, inadequate ventilation is going to occur when the chest doesn't move or air is escaping around the mass. We don't have a good seal or we're bagging too fast or too slow. Um, techniques should always assure adequate protection from body or the patient's body fluid. Never use mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation, and we're going to use some sort of barrier device. Now, if you're on an ambulance or your first responders, 99% um, of the time you're going to have a BBM, so we're going to use it. But if not, you should have at least a pocket mask. When we're ventilating a patient who is breathing too fast, which is more than 28 breaths per minute, we're going to assess the accuracy of respirations. We'll explain to the patient the procedure we're about to do. We're going to tell them, hey, I'm going to put this mask on your face, and I'm going to help you breathe. We're going to seal the mask to the face, and we're going to squeeze the bag when the patient inhales. Now, we're going to, after a few breaths, we're going to start adjusting the rate and the volume, we're going to give more volume. So we're going to start off with their rate and less volume, and then we're going to slow our rate down, but we're going to, we're going to force in more volume. This is going to help slow them down because they're going to get the oxygen that they need, and their brain's going to get, detect that, and it's going to slow their rate down. Now, on the flip side, when, when someone's breathing too slow, or not at all, we're going to carefully assess, again, the adequacy of the respiration. Is it adequate or not. Again, we'll explain the procedure. Again, we'll put the mask on when they squeeze. But the difference is we're going to ventilate to a total. We want to get a rate of 12. So, for example, if they're breathing six, that means in between their breaths, we're also going to give them a breath. We're going to give them a breath in between. So, if they're breathing six and we're breathing six, that'll add up to 12. Um, this is how we're going to ventilate. We're going to open the airway. When we open the airway, we're going to make sure it's clear. If not, we're going to suction. We're going to position the airway. Head elevated in that sniffing position is the optimal. We'll flex the neck forward, extend the head at the top of the neck, and our ears are going to be at the level of the super sternal notch. Sometimes we have to pad for this. Either, uh, especially like pediatric patients, we may have to pad underneath their shoulders and bring that airway into a line. Uh, they, they talk about this ramping position. This is we're going to raise the torso to a 45 degree angle. This is for like uh, heavy people or obese patients. We're going to plateau the head at the top of the ramp, and this will make that super sternal notch equal with the ear. Uh, when we're talking about spinal injuries, we're going to ventilate them in a neutral position. We're not going to uh, hyperextend that neck. Proper seal of the mask allows air to move into the lungs. These masks are teardrop shaped, so the mask should extend from the bridge of the nose to the cleft of the chin. 
to make sure it's wide enough to cover the entire mouth. And we're going to use two hands to create a seal when possible. If you're one person, uh, one person providing BBM, you're not going to be able to use two hands and bag at the same time. Um, there are certain things that interfere with the seal of the mat, like large, bushy boots. We can wetten it down sometimes, and that'll help um, with water-soluble lubricant, but not always. If the patient has dentures and they're not loose and floppy, leave them in there. That'll help create a seal. Um, how can we optimize the mask and using it? We can raise the patient's head at a 30-degree angle. We can use an airway adjunct, like class, class or last chapter, the OPA NPA. And we're going to use a team to ventilate. So two-person uh, BBM is way better than one person. Mouth to mask ventilation. It's a pocket mask. These masks are soft and collapsible. They come in those little red containers and they're all collapsed. You have to pull them out. They have infectious control features. They have one way valves so you can breathe in, but you're not breathing uh, in the patient's breath. Some of them have an oxygen in one, which is really good because we can provide supplemental oxygen. They're made of clear plastic that we can see and look through at the lips and, and the, the mouth. And some may have a strap on them, which strap around the head to help kind of hold them in place, which is nice because you can sense the strap down a little bit and help keep your seal. Here's a picture of it. Like I said, they usually come in a little red box. They're usually collapsed to pull them out, and we have to attach the valve to it. Uh, mouth to mask for patient with patients without uh, spinal injury. We go to the top of the head. Um, we're going to position yourself directly above the patient's head. We're going to put them in a sniffing position and insert an adjunct. So we're going to open the airway and put an adjunct in, usually an OPA. We're going to apply the mask. We're going to take our thumbs over the top of the mask, index finger at the bottom of the mask. And our finger underneath the jaw. So we're going to make that CE that we talked about last class. We're going to lift the jaw to the mask and tilt the patient's head backwards. Uh, why we lift the, why we're lifting the jaw? We're going to squeeze the mask and to make that seal, and we're going to give her breath into the one-way valve and watch her chest rise and fall. Here's a good picture of, of the exact example of what they're doing. All right, mouth to mouth a patient without suspected spinal injury. Position yourself at the head. This is exactly what we did, all right? Same stuff. All right, this is with a spinal injury. We're going to do the exact same thing as you can see until we lift the angle of the jaw using, but without tilting the head. So we're going to use the jaw thrust maneuver into the mask. And then we're going to do the same thing. Squeeze the mask and give, to, give a breath. Now the BBM or the bag, bag valve mask, uh, we use them to for non-breathing patients or ina inadequate breathing patients for people in respiratory failure. They provide a great infectious control barrier because our mouths aren't down there. They come in three sizes, the adult, child, and infant. They have a self-refilling shell, which means when I squeeze it and let go, it'll self-expand. They have a non-jamming valve that allows this oxygen inlet of 15 liters. And most of them will have bags attached to it. Here's a nice picture of it. Top one, of course, being the adult. The middle one being the pediatric or the child. And then the bottom one being an infant. The only difference is they all function the same. The only difference is volume, how much volume's in there. Uh, the mechanics of BVM. Oxygen is attached and enters the reservoir or the bag. When we squeeze this bag, or the, squeeze it, the air inlet closes and the oxygen is delivered to the patient. So we squeeze it, the inlet from the bag into the, uh, the reservoir, I'm sorry, into the bag is closed. And then we deliver the, the breath to the patient. 
we'll release the patient's passive uh, passively expires when he breathes out passively. And while he's exhaling, or the time it takes for him to exhale, oxygen will refill this reservoir or the, the little plastic bag on the end. All right, how do we use it for non trauma patients? We're going to place the patient in a head elevated sniffing position and we're going to insert an adjunct. Select the correct BBM. So if it's an adult, we're going to use an adult. But sometimes it's a small adult and we use a child on a small adult. Uh, kneel at the patient's head, thumbs along the side of the mask, and press the mask downward. You're going to put the top or the apex of this teardrop or triangle mask over the bridge of the nose. And then you're going to lower it down over the mouth and over the chin area. Index middle finger and ring fingers. Bring the jaw up to the mask. Uh, the second rescuer connects and squeezes the bag until the, the chest rises. And then the second rescuer will release the bag and let the patient exhale. This is if you have two people. If we have a spinal injury, it all starts off the same. The only difference is we're going to, instead of tilt the head, we're going to bring the jaw up using the jaw thrust maneuver. Here's two-person BBM. This is the ideally the best you're ever going to get with rescue breathing because one rescuer is holding the tight seal the entire time and the other one's squeezing the back or breathing. Here's one rescuer. Uh, we've talked about this uh, several times in class, but you may be watching this video and not in my class. So we're going to go, we're going to start off the same, head elevated sniffing position and add an in, insert an adjunct. We're going to make sure we have the correct size mask. And we're going to position our face over the, over as if for two fresh cures. We're going to form a C on the top using our thumb and index finger. And the other three fingers are going to go underneath the jaw. And that's the E. We talked about the CE method. So we're going to go underneath the jaw. And the, the thumb and index finger is going to go on the mask, making a C. So that's why we call it the CE maneuver. Squeeze the bag with one hand. We should see chest rise if we've got a proper seal. And we're going to release the bag, let the patient exhale, let the reservoir fill up with oxygen. For some reason, if the chest doesn't rise, we're going to reposition the head. Maybe we don't have the airway completely open. We're going to make sure we have a good seal. Check for air escaping around the house. We're going to check for obstructions. Um, and if we, we have an obstruction that we can clear, we're going to clear. If not, we're going to go back to uh, the um, abdominal thrust or CPR. If none of this work, we're going to try an altered method of ventilation. Uh, BBM may be used during CPR, of course, for, for the bag is squeezed once every time a ventilation is delivered. On rescue CPR, it's preferred to use a pocket mask with something on oxygen because it's easier to make the seal. All right, we can use both our hands and then we breathe in. So one rescue CPR, it is preferred to use a pocket mask uh, because you can get a better seal, easier seal. All right. So artificial ventilation using the stoma. We're going to clear the mucus plug or secretion because they're going to have a lot of secretion or mucus. We're going to leave the head in a neutral position. We don't have to worry about uh, putting them in snipping or opening the airway. We use a pediatric mass. We're going to put a seal around the stoma, ventilate at the appropriate rate. And if unable to ventilate through the stoma, we're going to seal that stoma off and use normal mouth to mouth, mouth to nose ventilations. Uh, improper ventilation rates can harm a patient. Too slow will cause hypoventilation and hypoxic. Too fast calls hyperventilation and vasoconstriction because of the higher levels of CO2. And we don't want our vasoconstriction during, uh, like someone's not breathing. If possible, one rescuer should focus on ventilation while the other focus on maintaining the airway. That's still. So ideally, it's when we're using a BBM, two-person is ideal.
adults should be ventilated 10 to 12 times per minute, which is every five to six seconds. Children can be ventilated at 12 to 20 times a minute. Um, improper ventilation can cause harm. Too much pressure can cause gastric distension, which can cause vomiting. Too much volume can cause lung tissue trauma or barotrauma. Uh, we can do damage to the lung by putting too much in there. Should be pressure should be delivered slow and gentle. We uh, can just go up and squeeze the bag as hard as we can, as fast as we can. Uh, one hand or two to three fingers for the squeeze. We should deliver these ventilations over a one second period. And we're going to only ventilate only until the chest begins to move. We don't have to see full chest expansion to be given proper ventilations. All right, let's talk about these ATVs or automatic transport ventilators. Uh, these things we used to see in the past, but I haven't seen them in a while. But we're going to talk about them. They're used during respiratory arrest. It has settings for the rate and volume, so we can set how much we're delivering and when. It's easily portable. It's very portable. Um, if we have prolonged ventilations, like if we've got a long transport time, or if there's only one rescuer, this may be a, a, a device you can use to help ventilate your patient. And we have to provide the we, the provider must ensure that the rate is appropriate for the patient's size and condition, and we have to make sure we have a proper seal. Here's a picture of this ATV. They put a quarter on there just to show you how, how on scale. And you can see the airflow comes in on, on which would be the left, and it goes out on the right. Three knobs. you got your rate. Uh, select if it's an adult or child, and then we're going to select volume, your tidal volume. How much are we going to give per breath? All right, oxygen therapy. Oxygen is important in beneficial treatment, right? Um, but you have to remember it's a drug. On our ambulance, it's a drug. And it is possible to give too much or too little. Remember, oxygen can cause harm. It can cause damage to the heart attack. It can cause damage to a heart attack or stroke patients. And our um, oxygen administration is based on evaluation. So anybody that is 94 and below, hypoxia, or uh, decompensating at all, gets oxygen. Always ventilate cardiac arrest patients. So we're going to ventilate them always, regardless. Uh, equipment, oxygen equipment must be safe, lightweight, right? It has to be light so we can carry it for portability. And it has to be dependable. It means it has to work when we need it. Um, most systems contain cylinders. You have some sort of regulator, or pressure regulates, and a delivery device of some sort, like a pocket or I mean, a normal breather, a nasal cannula, or some way we're getting the oxygen from the, the regulator to the patient. Remember, devices like the BBM and pocket mask can use oxygen. They have inlets for the hook to a cylinder. Cylinders are their seamless steel or alloy canister filled with oxygen under pressure. That's the key word. They are under pressure. We have different sizes of these oxygen cylinders. Uh, most ambulances, we carry the D cylinders, which has 350 liters. That'll be a portable oxygen cylinder, which is usually affixed to your cot somehow. You'll see these E cylinders. They're a little larger. They're usually like in hospitals, attached to hospital beds, or they're put in these little wheel, wheelie carts that they use. M cylinders are the big onboard oxygen that we use on all our ambulances, both the ambulances. And they carry 3,000 liters of oxygen when full. The G and the H are bigger series oxygen tanks. Um, a lot of times they're used at fill stations to fill portables. Uh, you can put them on some ambulances do carry like 
a G tank cylinder. It's a little bigger than the M. Or we'll see the eight cylinders on like critical care units. And they may have two of them on there. So they have quite a bit of oxygen, right? Look, they're eight cylinder and 6,900 liters. They're going to be green or they're going to be green and white. But they're going to have some sort of green on them. Uh, green coloring indicates oxygen cylinder. Here's a picture. This would be an M uh, cylinder on an ambulance. Cylinder safety. We're always going to use pressure gauges, regulators, and tubing intended for that oxygen use. We're going to use a non-phosphorus wrench when we're dealing with these. So we don't want something that could create a spark. We're going to ensure that the valve seats, inserts, and gaskets are in good condition. Because if not, they're not going to work properly or they're going to leak. We're only going to use medical grade oxygen. There are different grades in oxygen. For example, your acetylene torch set will have a different grade of oxygen than your medical grade. So we're not going to take a, a, an oxygen saline set, take the oxygen bottle off and put it in our ambulance. We're always going to open the valve fully, then close it in half a turn to prevent someone from trying to force the valve. We're going to store them in a cool, ventilated room with prop, a proper secure in place. These cylinders have to be hydrostatically tested every five years. It's usually done by the oxygen company or the supplier. We're not going to drop these cylinders or let them fall against an object. This could rupture the tank. We're not going to leave them standing upright without them being secured. If they fall and the valve breaks, you've just created a missile. Never smoke around oxygen. It's common sense. Oxygen fuels the fire. Now here, we never use it on open flame. We're not going to use grease, oil, or fat-based soaps on these devices that will be attached to cylinders. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. That could cause an explosion. We're going to use adhesive tape. And we're not going to move by dragging the cylinder or rolling it or on its side or bottom. Here's uh they're saying to prevent tipping over, we're going to lay the cylinder horizontal and we're going to secure it. Pressure regular, regulators. It must be connected to a cylinder and provide safe working pressure of 30 to 70 PSI. On an each series or smaller, these regulators are secured by a yoke assembly, which is like a a twisting nut or bolt on the east side on anything larger than E, it's going to be secured by a threaded outlet. They will actually thread on like the tanks in our the onboard tanks are going to be threaded on. Uh, before we connect the cylinder, we're going to open the main valve slightly, and this is going to blow out any dust or dirt in there, which could cause an issue with the cylinder sealing or the regulator sealing on the cylinder. We're going to talk about uh, different gauges now. Flow meters allow control of the flow of oxygen in liters per minute. And we have two types of low pressure flow meters. This is the pressure, pressure compensated flow meters and used for larger cylinders in the ambulance. This is our, like on our onboard. These are the same uh, flow meters you're going to see at the hospital. Constant flow selector valves are used on any size cylinder. I don't, these are the ones that you see on your little portables. However, we have a lot of us have switched and went to these high pressure flow meters um, for oxygen powered devices, respirators, and ventilators. And we'll show you pictures of these. Here is the low pressure flow meters. And the, like I said, the one on the right is one you're going to see in your ambulance. That's the pressure compensated flow meter and the other one is a constant flow so we select what we want like two liters 
and it's going to constantly be delivering two liters. Uh, you'll see these on ambulances yet, uh, but uh, most of us has changed, and I'll show you. This is what we've changed to, the high flow meter. It looked like the uh, constant flow, but it has this little uh, screw-on device on the bottom, which will allow us to uh, high flow oxygen into like a, like a CPAP or a vent or something like that. Humidifiers can be connected to the the oxygen. Um, this is basically a non-breakable jar of water that the oxygen bubbles through. So it's going to moisturize the oxygen. Uh, not often used in EMS because our transports are short. Uh, we see these at long-term, like nursing facility or hospital. But we can, um, if they've been hospitalized for a while, and we've got a longer transport, like a hospital, a hospital, uh, I have seen these used in an ambulance before. Here's a picture of the humidifier. It's a plastic bottle that screws on to our, our, our oxygen outlet or our trees, what we call a Christmas tree. And then we hook our oxygen tubing up to it. Uh, Non-medical hazards are extremely rare and can be avoided by treating properly, right? If a tank is punctured or valve breaks off, the supply of the tank can become a missile. We talked about earlier. If it falls over and the valve breaks, it can shoot off and rock it off. So we don't want to do that. Um, oxygen will fuel a fire. So for near fire, it can cause fire. Uh, oxygen under pressure and oil will create a severe uh, explosion. So we don't want to do that. So we keep away from oil-based stuff. Medical hazards can occur by, by taking time to develop and are rarely seen by EMTs, right? So... There are some hazards of oxygen therapy that will develop, and it takes time. So a lot of times we don't see this because we're not with our patients for hours on upon hours. One of these things is oxygen toxicity or air sac collapse occurs when there's an overload of oxygen. Um, eye damage may occur to premature infants when they receive oxygen over a long period. It affects their um, uh, retina or their nerve endings. Respiratory depression or respiratory rest can occur when a hypoxic drive and is depressed in COPD patients. We'll talk about that later, but if they're on oxygen or high flow oxygen for an extreme amount of time, it can knock out their drive to breathe. Uh, underlying conditions can be extubated as in a myocardial infarction or a stroke. Uh, administration options. Various devices are available. You know, work with the instructor and you'll go over this. And we'll talk about it in a little bit. Supplemental oxygen should be used when there is shortness of breath, hypoxia, or low oxygen saturation. For mild distress, administer low concentrated oxygen via nasal cannula. For moderate, we're going to administer oxygen via non rebreather. So if we're in a severe to moderate distress, we're going to give them high flow oxygen. Local protocols may offer additional guidance. Now remember, the flow rate on nasal cannula is one to six liters. The flow rate on a non rebreather is 12 to 15 liters. Uh, now to breathe, the best way to deliver high concentration of oxygen to a breathing patient. Must be properly placed and properly sealed on their face. And you have to inflate the reservoir bag because it has a bag attached to it before putting the mask on the patient. Or any time that the oxygen is flow is disrupted for some reason, this mask has to be removed immediately from the patient. 
they're non-rebreathers, which means they're not getting outside oxygen or air. All the air is coming through this bag. So if we don't have a flow of oxygen in this bag, uh, the bag will uh, deflate and they won't, the patient will basically suffocate. And that's what we're just talking about. Maintaining 15 liters, this will provide an 80 to 90% concentration of oxygen to your patient. Um, supplemental oxygen for patients with chest pain. Exhaled air escapes through the flutter valve and does not return to the reservoir. This is a non breather. When they breathe out, these little flutter valves on the outside will open up, let the air out, and then they'll suck back in when they go to breathe. Uh, some have safety features, which is an emergency port that enables the patient to receive air if for some reason this bag fails. non breathers should be used in patients with hypoxia, with shortness of breath, chest pain, or altered mental status. Here's a picture of a non breather Here's another one. See the little round desk on the side? These are flutter valves. That they'll let the patient the air to escape when they breathe out. Nasal cannula provides between 24 to 44% oxygen concentration, depending on your flow rate. It's delivered through two prongs in the nostril. Uh, it's held in place by putting the tube over here, and then we use a slip lot, uh, slip loop under the chin. Uh, oxygen delivery by cannula should not exceed four to six liters a minute. Six will be the top. Cannula can be a choice for patients who refuse to wear an oxygen mask. They can't tolerate the mask, so we go to the cannula. Or they don't. They're not in severe respiratory distress. They're in moderate or minor. Here's a picture of a cannula. A partial non a partial rebreather mask is very simple to not similar to non rebreather. Um, it does not have a one-way valve like the non-breather, so it allows the patient to rebreathe about one-third of their exhaled air. This is useful to preserve carbon dioxide level to stimulate breathing. Um, it delivers about 40 to 60 percent concentrated oxygen at a 9 to 10 liter rate. A venturi mask or a simple mask. Um, it delivers a specific concentration of oxygen by mixing oxygen with the inhaled air. Mask package contains different tips to provide different concentrations of oxygen. Most commonly used with COPD patients. This is a form of a simple mask. Uh, they have several different ones. A tracheostoma mask is placed over a stoma or tracheostoma tube to provide supplement oxygen. Typically small cup like mask that fits over the tracheostoma. We're going to use 8 to 10 liters per minute of oxygen via the mask. And here's a picture of the stoma mask. Uh, supplemental oxygen for patients with chest pain. High concentration of oxygen should be administered to children respiratory stress with inadequate respiration or impossible shock. Infants and children may benefit, benefit from blow by. So they may not be able to tolerate that mask. They're very anxious. So they may have to use a blow by. We're going to hold, hold it in a tubing or a non rebreather mask about two inches from their face. Oxygen passing over the face and then is inhaled. Um, there are methods out there. There's endless amounts of methods, but one is a styrofoam cup with a hole poked in the bottom. You put your tubing in that. Uh, they do have special devices like 
teddy bears that have auction outlets that they can use as bull buy. It, it's endless of what can, you can use. Special consideration, facial injuries. But remember that anything in the face and head is very vascular and bleed a lot. So we may have to use frequent suctioning. Um, we may have to add an adjunct. In a conscious patient, we may have to put an NPAN. Or they may need to be intubated with an endotracheal tube, which is definitely outside the scope of an EMT. But you may have to help your paramedic partner intubate. Uh, remember, some obstructions that solid um, suction units are really not adequate for removing solid objects. If it's completely obstructed, we're going to use abdominal thrust, chest thrust, and finger sweeps. Dental appliances. We're going to leave them in place as long as they're secure. It's going to help create that seal that we need. Um, if partials become dislodged, we're going to remove them. I'm going to be prepared to remove them if it endangers the airway. Uh, remember on the child, they have large tongue. Their tracheas are, are more flexible, softer, and they have a larger head. Chest walls are soft. The diaphragm breathing is more important. Remember all their muscles are underdeveloped, so they don't work as well as a human or adult. I'm sorry. And they're going to burn twice as much oxygen. The rate is going to be, sorry, oxygen burn rate is twice that of the adult. Um, infant and children, we're going to avoid excessive pressure and volume, right? They have small lungs. So we put too much too quick, we can do barotrauma or damage to the lung. We're going to make sure we use the proper size mask. If we use an adult mask, we're not going to get a seal. Or if we use an infant mask on a child, we won't get the proper seal. So we want the proper size. Remember, flow restricting oxygen powered ventilation devices are contraindicated for children and infants. We're going to use the proper size non rubber breather and nasal cannula. There are pediatric and infant non rubber breathers and nasal cannula. So we're going to use the proper size for the proper patient. And gastric detention may impair the adequate ventilation we talked about earlier. If we if our belly is starting to uh, extend or distend, our diaphragm has no room to contract and go down. So this can cause an issue. Assisting with advanced airway devices. Um, before paramedic places a tube, you may be asked to pre-oxygenate or give extra oxygen. Uh, paramedic position the patient's head in the sniffing position. The paramedic or advanced EMT, I'm sorry, advanced EMT can do this as well. They'll remove that oral airway and they'll pass the tube in its place. You may be asked to help the burp maneuver. Here's a picture of it. We're going to pressure the thumb and index finger on either side of the throat around the carotid cartilage and uh, gently direct the throat upward and towards the patient's right. This is the burp maneuver. Uh, once the tube is in place, the paramedic assures proper placement via methods, two different methods. Uh, it's called confirming tube placement. The tube will be anchored with some sort of uh, tube holder. You may ask to monitor the lung sounds and epigastric sounds. And we're not going to disturb this tube if once it's been placed and secured. Uh, just remember, very very little movements can displace the, the tube. So we're going to we're going to confirm the tube placement after any movement we do with the patient. We're going to ventilate about ten times a minute. Hold the tube against the patient's teeth with two fingers. On one hand, of one end, 
work the BBM with the other. When we're ventilating a breathing patient, time ventilation with respiratory efforts as much as possible. We're going to pay attention to resistance. We're going to report this to our medic that we're having issues getting this to go in, or it's really hard to, to go in. If a patient's defibrillated, we're going to remove the bag from the tube, and we're going to get the oxygen away from uh, as we defibrillate. We're going to watch for any mental status changes. Um, and we may have to remove the bag or the BBM from the tube during CPR if the medic has to use the tube to uh, uh, administer medication. Uh, provide manual inline stabilization throughout the process. Uh, medic may hold the head while you put a cervical collar on. We'll talk more about that later in trauma. Uh, you will then stabilize the head with the patient's side. Paramedic leans back using a lingeroscope and tubes the patient. And after intubation, you will hold the tube against the teeth until placement is confirmed. The tube will be anchored. You must hold ma uh, manual stabilization in addition to the collar until the head is taped to the backbone. And that does it for this uh, chapter. We'll see you on the next one.